Welcome to the Rooted Healing Podcast, where we seek to deepen our kinship with the living landscapes around us and within us. This is a space where stories heal with words that weave us closer to our wild and interrelational nature, where we explore ways to root down and re-indigenize ourselves to the land, ecosystems, communities, and practices that help us heal, reimagine, and co-create the world we love to be alive in. For me, that's really profound, is these, these simple acts and these simple ways of living, because they take us away from thinking that these big, complex, messy systems are actually even particularly necessary, when it's like, actually, I get most of my food from around here, I get most of my fun from my community and my connections to people here. What, what do I really need? You know? I think the exploration into voluntary simplicity and simple living is perhaps one of the biggest opportunities for, for positive change globally. This is a nourishing, gentle conversation with Ben Stopford, who is a facilitator, gardener and gatherer living in community in the heart of Arari in North Wales. He offers the creation of wild culture gardens and the pollination of foraging for food, medicine and connection to place. He studied sustainable food and natural resources and he carries the work that reconnects from Joanna Macy as well as contemporary rites of passage. He's been facilitating courses in deep ecology, bioregionalism, foraging, wild culture gardening, and holding initiation ceremonies such as with the Kingly Stag, which he's co-founded with two others, all held within his project Conscious Roots. We're rooty folk. Ben and I have merged courses because we've been carrying such similar synonymous work and we recognised the the joy, the beauty, the potential of merging our two approaches, our two perspectives as facilitators. So we're bringing you Deepen Your Roots, which enrolls next year, 2024, on the Celtic in bulk in February. And I'm going to take up a lot of space at the start of this episode telling you about this course because it's something we're both bringing forth and we really want to give you an idea of what it's all about. And so for the first part, I will be sharing more about that and then we dive into this lovely conversation with Ben. So Deepen Your Roots is a year-long slow study weaving deep ecology, the work that reconnects and a folkloric animistic exploration into the ecological self rewoven with place. So why a slow study? Well we feel that we're in a landscape of information overload and noise and a kind of fast-paced instant gratification expectation from these experiences and we really want to shift that paradigm and invite you into a much deeper, much more embodied, practical exploration of yourself and your place and from there activating this level of belonging that's cellular. You know, it's not, we're not just intellectualizing it and offering lectures about it and keeping it in the sort of dialogue realm we're really bringing it into the roots of our being into the roots of place we've called this a journey of honoring belonging and becoming and the reason we're doing it over 13 moons is because a big part is re-indigenization of the self and what that means it's available to anyone anywhere wherever you find yourself how do we feel belonging to place and how do we act and live from that place in the way that the indigenous psyche would and so the reason we're doing it with the 13 moons is because the whole course everything is connected much more to what is actually available to us to read you know sky language earth language the non-human language as well as of course the human community that's a big part of this journey as well So in deepening connections to land, food, water, flora and fauna, community, folklore, geology, ancestry, song and tradition, this journey will root you into a feeling of home, purpose and animistic interbeing. 
And there's a lot to be said about, okay, what is animistic interbeing? I'm sure a lot of you listening will have a sense of what that is, just to try and summarize something that's very complex and profound and I would say ineffable. It's a sense of being that goes beyond the small self, beyond the ego, a sense of being that reaches into the ecology and the ecosystems around us into an alive, almost erotic and sensuous experience of what it is to be here, interconnected with all that exists around us. There's so much more to that, but that's my attempt for now to summarise. This is about cultivating a kind of resilience and sense of purpose and arising projects of deep and profound meaning that come from the wisdom of place. So at the end of the year, you can be pinned onto our bioregionalism guardians map, helping pollinate broad landscapes with leaders of ecological intimacy and bioregional stewardship. So Ben's going to talk a little bit more about what bioregionalism is in this episode, in case you've never heard that word before. And you're like, what is Ronnie talking about? This is a life way. This is something we can pass on to the next generations. This is something we can cross pollinate with other bioregional guardians. Throughout the program, you will have the opportunity to explore and develop offerings to nourish your ecological niche. And some questions I want to ask you that may lead you to this work is, have you felt uprooted by mainstream monoculture? Weeded from overtilled soil that threw out community and diversity, beaten by its machinery of quote unquote progress. Do you long to find community, meaning and sustenance and to live in reciprocity with life and your relationships? What are the stories keeping you from rooting deeper? With ever-growing displacement, detachment and dissociative sensibilities, we call to those who yearn to dig deep and cultivate the connection, awareness and service that is so desperately needed to heal our inner and outer landscapes. Finding ways to compost what needs to be composted, as Sophie Strand so eloquently speaks about, and ways to water and nourish what yearns to be rewilded. When I think of this monoculture that has been created by mainstreaming so much of this rich indigenous lineage that comes from every single place wherever we are I really see this as a profound act of rewilding a a rewilding I know some people get really agitated by rewilding being used as a metaphor and also decolonization like these things are not metaphors and at the same time we we do need to include the human psyche the sense of self and place into the equation, into the alchemy of what it actually means to rewild. This course is born from the recognition that our problem is a lonely one. Because when we leave that monoculture of the mainstream, it's hard. It expels us into doubt, scrutiny, perhaps, and many, many unknowns. So carving our way with our hearts and eyes open, it requires a courage of a new kind. You know, Francis Weller speaks to this so beautifully because we are in turbulent times, there's no denying it, both individually and collectively. And the Anthropocene is collapsing (laughs) as we realise how entangled our lives are with one another and beyond into the non-human. And this disequilibrium shaking the world feels like a continual tremor on the fault lines of our psychic lives and I'm massively paraphrasing Francis Weller. Very few things feel stable. Deepen your roots will provide you a map to navigate this initiatory threshold. It is a map that bridges inner and outer worlds through animistic eyes and asks us to listen deeply to what is being asked of us at this time. And just to quote properly Francis Weller here, this is a time for bold gestures. It is a time to wake up and humbly take our place on this stunning planet. The future is speaking ruthlessly through us. And I also feel called to add that any of you who are curious about psychedelic integration, there's actually very 
little out there in terms of programs that really look at the complexities of what we're talking about here with psychedelic integration. You know, what is that? (laughs) I would say psychedelics are providing that expansion into the ecological self or an animistic understanding of the world in which we live. And what, what I would say, based on my research and just embodied experienced understanding, is the way the indigenous psyche understands life. It's the innate relationship with life that entheogenic practices can reactivate after hundreds or thousands of years of social conditioning of disconnect and competition. And so deepen your roots if you're interested in in coming from this angle, I would argue is the most comprehensive psychedelic integration pathway available at the moment. Although I must say that sounded a bit competitive. So (laughs) I'm sure there's some beautiful things out there. But from what I have perceived, I feel really passionate about this being a deep dive into implementing and embodying the insights that arise and the often biophilic expansionary experience with psychedelics into our lives in a, a really profound way. And just to quote Sophie Strand here, because it's so relevant to this inquiry, quote, I'm much more interested in ensoilment than ensoulment. I want to have actual roots. I want my spirituality to have fur, pheromones, funk. I want to live in a specific place. And I want it to teach me intimately how to be dynamically present and useful to my ecosystem. I want to tell people that healing isn't about completion and it isn't about lightness. It's about the mixing bowl where nothing is exiled, everything is included. In order to grow a garden, you need manure. You need compost. In order to heal the soil, you don't clean it, you add to it. End quote. Wise, wise being. (laughs) We're so lucky to have her on this, supporting this truly, supporting this project. So that was a lot of information. I hope you feel a resonance with this work. I hope you feel inspired. Even if you don't feel called to sign up with this, I hope you feel a taste of the kind of journey we can all be going on in these times. So to learn more, head to rootedhealing.org slash deepen. I haven't released a podcast since the conflict with Israel and Gaza has unfolded. We were actually holding our earth medicine retreat in the Netherlands and we we had someone on the retreat from Israel. So it was very interwoven into the group's personal process with healing and integrating their own experience from a psychedelic retreat amidst a world that doesn't make sense amidst a world in trauma and um, having that direct link through the person who who was there who was landing back into that is yeah brings it into a much more interpersonal paradigm and it's been really complicated and it is really complicated so nuanced and so complex and I was speaking about it with Lilia the incredible psychologists that we work with and she came across this piece Um, I don't know who wrote it it spoke to something that I needed to hear and it says connect me with people who are able to hold nuance who understand that life is always full of paradox who weep at violence no matter the optics who move slowly enough to let context inform their choices who don't try to make things unnecessarily complex to avoid an uncomfortable truth, who also don't make things implausibly simple to fit a narrative. Connect me with people who are willing to feel the grief of centuries and who are still somehow able to love the world. Allowing our hearts to feel this collective grief and finding the ways in which we can show up. I don't, it's not clear for me how that is yet. I mean, I've been donating money to children of Gaza and 
being in conversation and like from the quote I've just read, just really feeling the nuance, feeling the complexity, feeling the grief. And with that, actually, I feel really cool to reshare Natalie Nahai's song, My Lover's Arms, because it's just a song that carries this tenderness in my heart and hopefully in yours too with such profundity. So it feels right. And then after the song, enjoy the nourishing time with Ben. I am the wind, she said, I am the sea. How can my lover's arms hope to hold me when I am the whisper that turns to a roar when the wild and the weary that knocks at your door I am the fire that threatens to burn all the tales you've been told all the lessons you've learned from the joy and the sorrow that rips through your chest the dream that consumes you the one you love best How can you ask me to fall back these wings? If I fall from the sky, then I lose everything. I was born to the wind and the sun and the sea. How can my lover's arms hope to hold me? So she told me a tale of the things she'd seen, the people she loved and the places she'd been. Promise of freedom if only she tried To walk like the others and to give up her flight And they thought it a kindness when they gave her cage She folded her form and contorted her face But the bars were too tight and they burned through her skin Try as she might know she couldn't fit in Said, I am the beauty that longs to be seen I'm the breeze in your hair and the dew at your feet In the stillness of morning before the dawn breaks and The warmth and the light and the pleasure you take From the sweetest of rains when the well has run dry The promise of summer in the dead of the night touch of dry land when you're drowning at sea how could your arms ever hope to hold me so she called to the darkness and the darkness replied you must unfold your wings you must take to the sky these people may love you but your hands are tied if you stay any longer you're surely tired So she picked at the lock And she opened the door The steps that she took They were broken and raw And the earth yielded kindly Beneath her feet And the taste of freedom Never seemed so sweet She said I am the wind oh, And I am the sea oh, How can my lover's arms hold Hold me when I am the whisper that turns to a roar The wild and the weary that knocks at your door I am the fire that threatens to burn All the tales you've been told, all the lessons you learn I'm the joy and the sorrow that rips through your chest The dream that consumes you, the one you love best and how could you ask me to fall back these wings? If I fall from the sky, then I lose everything. I was born to the wind and the sun and the sea. How can my lover's arms hope to hold me? So my name's Ben. Um, I grew up in Devon. Um, pretty much in the middle of the woods, um, quite an old woodland. There's a lot of beech woodland around where I grew up. Um, and it was a, yeah, a lovely old farmhouse. So that, that landscape shaped me, I suppose. I was there until I was 11, um, having left London when I was one. And so the, the kind of Devon landscape still really calls to me. There's something about those, those beech forests that uh, is very settling for me. They're kind of, they're quite simple forests. 
quite spacious and full of light. Um, and calling in an animal, the first animal that comes to mind is the eagle. I live in Snowdonia, which in Welsh, Ereri, kind of refers to the, the abode of the eagle. And it really makes me a bit sad, in a way, calling in the eagle, because I presume that the name is because uh, there were eagles here. But there are no eagles here now, so there's this kind of quite literal literal calling in of, um, you know, how long will it be until the eagles return? What do we need to do to the landscape to encourage and see the eagles returning to the land here? Yeah, I saw they'd introduced white-tailed eagles in Scotland, haven't they? Mm-hmm. I wonder mm. if they'll make their way down to Arari. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe if we call them in enough, they will. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I think that they are, the golden eagle also is making its way south mm-hmm. from Scotland. So I think just the, the landscape needs to provide what, what they need. You know? And so, yeah, it's a big question here of how do we, how do we do that? And partly that's a human question as well, you know, what do, what do the people need to, to do or to change in their ways so the eagles feel comfortable here too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you about your journey, whether that inv- whether it's involved stepping away from the wild places to realise that you absolutely needed to come back to the wild places. It sounds like getting out of London when you were one was quite the uh, early escape from, yeah. you know, the Anthropocene. Um, but yeah, how at what point has it always just been a natural evolution or was there a point where you just knew that you had to make this your life's work I guess it's an ongoing balance like there's still a part of it that involves trying to figure out the right balance like, there's a part of me that still feels called to go and live in in a big city um, it's a small part <laughs> <laughs> but there's something really exciting about all of the people and all of the culture and all of the things happening um, and so I think I've gone to quite an extreme a couple of times and it takes me a little while to calibrate and come back to the the kind of people community the people part of the ecosphere um yeah like for example i bought a farm in spain it was really in the middle of nowhere and it didn't take that long for me sitting there realizing that the kind of human community is such a vital part of what i want and need and yeah plays a plays a massive role in in the work that i hope to do and want to do which is again still another ongoing calibration of what that looks like but so yeah here feels well balanced here feels like uh, it has the wild places. It certainly has the rivers to swim in and the mountains to climb. And But it has the most beautiful human community as well that is um, sort of unfolding. It's taken quite a long time. I've been here on and off for eight years now. Um, and it's only in the last year and a half or two years maybe that the, the human community has started to kind of show its face to me a little more. And even that comes with all of its, you know, its complexities. You know, this is this is Wales. I'm I don't speak Welsh. I'm just trying to learn at the minute, but I will never be of here. You know, I will never have been born here, <laughs> and so there is that complexity of like trying to put put my roots down in this place, this land, with this human community, and there always being a slight sense of of lostness, and that's cultural. That's not that's not just my personal journey. That's just that we live in a time where we we move around. You know, not that many people are still in the same place they were born when they're, when they're 16 or 17, um, and certainly not by the time they're in their 30s. Mm. And so that, yeah, that's part of the exploration is how do we, in some sense, how do we kind of put down these annual roots? How do we root quickly and, uh, and still, still go through the process of experiencing a place in its fullness? And that's part of the exploration here. Mm, I find so much humbleness in that answer and I, kn- I didn't even know that you had a farm in Spain <laughs> wow mm. <laughs> yeah it was a hilarious story I, I um, did a Vipassana 10 day silent meditation and on the last day I was looking up at the valley it was in, in a valley in Spain near Madrid and I said oh, okay I'm just going to live here it was mm-hmm. like this really quick there's probably a lot of people who make intriguing decisions during things like the past <laughs> and so I walked from the centre to Madrid and I was following this river valley and just inquiring in cafes and local places about a farm and I just found this you know what I deemed to be the perfect the perfect plot to uh, to sit there and have a quiet life in the woods um, but you know a few months in and it's like 
Okay, I do love the woods, I do love the rivers, but there's there's more there's more that needs to um exist in my life and, and more that I can do as well, you know, in, in return. Wow. <laughs> that is such a Ben way to look for a property to follow the river. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a funny hobby that one. Yeah. Kind of Yeah. Yeah, you've spoken to this um very very widespread felt experience of not quite tapping into the kind of belonging that we're all really yearning for through yeah, the amount of movement that now exists, the amount of displacement and just the general culture of how we live our lives and so obviously this has birthed both of our courses that are now merging it's, it was really brilliant when I came across your course and thought okay there's someone out there basically doing almost the exact same thing <laughs> but with a different lens and a different language which I always find so beautiful so maybe you could introduce the notion of bioregionism and then we can explore your journey into cultivating belonging through your local bioregion. Yeah, so bioregionalism, effectively it's about living locally. You know, it's, it, there's a lot of different environmental kind of sustainability movements that speak about the, the benefits of living locally. And they're often framed around lowering carbon emissions, effectively. How do we remove a lot of the complex transportation and things, food systems, all of the these these complex systems that lead to a lot of problems so part of that localization is about the environmental question and that's how i came to it was it was an interest in reducing my carbon footprint and becoming more environmentally conscious i suppose and the kind of accidental thing that happened in focusing on on this local area is this this sense of belonging more to an area when you focus on it and so for me to tap into bioregionalism is to study where it is that you live and come to some kind of naturally and culturally defined boundaries and make that your life, make that area your focus. The benefits and the, the things that come forth through living in that way have been really surprising. They weren't kind of necessarily intended. Even just something as simple as um, minimising overwhelm. With asking this question, what's what's my work to do here? Mm. Um, for me, it was this environmental framing of that. For others, it will be, you know, a whole number of different things. But that question becomes a lot easier when you when you geographically and culturally define an area that you're working with. But it also becomes much more personal, and so that's where the deep ecology comes in. Is this idea that when I embed myself in the bioregion, there's this this expression, the ecological self. And the ecological self is the, the self beyond the ego, the self that is part of the landscape and the systems that they live in. So the inseparability of me from my food and from my community of people and even from the health of the river that runs past my house. And, and the idea is that you can expand this ec ecological self, you can kind of grow into it. And so you stop being, Alan Watts, Alan Watts called it the skin encapsulated ego, mm. this kind of bag of bones. And you start to expand out and it's not in some kind of grandiose way. It's just in recognition that I am not a separate thing. You know, I am totally entwined and interconnected with with the entire planet, really. But the, but the ease of settling into a, a kind of eco region, a bio region, makes it very literal. Because I understand where my water comes from or I understand what plants I can eat and where my food comes from and I simplify in that way and because I can see it you know there's that expression not in my backyard which is often referring to things like wind turbines and nuclear power plants you know mm. yeah, yeah, yeah I'm all for them it's great but just not here mm. <laughs> not not where I am I don't want to see them put them elsewhere but when you bring in this this bioregional framing it's like it's all in my backyard so what's okay you know if I don't want nuclear energy plants in my backyard I don't want them anywhere <laughs> yeah so what can work you know how can we build and it's not about closing off to the outside world you know as with the ecological self-concept it's in recognition that that bioregion is entirely connected in and reliant on the other bioregions 
So it's not about creating little kind of secret clans or, or walls or anything like that. It's just a kind of recognition that naturally this is the place where I sit and where I live and I can have a great impact on this area by putting my focus on that. And the impact becomes personal because it's my land, you know, it's not, not in an ownership sense, but in a, I live here. You know, this is where, where my food comes from, it's where my water comes from, it's where my friends and family live and you know it's mm. it's all right here yeah you've written about shifting from the um, anthropocentric to the biocentric to really meet the ecological self and I love that but I also recognize that for some people there's still a lot of fear of living really in wild places or in nature or in what some might perceive as like a smaller way of life mm. and I think there's the archetype of the hermit that comes up for a lot of people or there's just stories that might block people to actually cultivating this kind of belonging. And I was curious what you've noticed in terms of barriers to belonging that are generally built within the collective human psyche at the moment. Yeah, I mean, first thing, I think that one of the most interesting things about this idea of expanding the ecological self or living by originally is um it you don't have to live in the wild you know you could you could be in the center of london mm. and still have an amazing experience in deepening the ecological self and and learning about your bioregion like yeah. it's it's all there you know it's still built on top of rock and river you know this, and, and you don't need to be trying to restore it in any way it's just about knowing it's there and connecting to these things and people finding that there's uh, there's beautiful farms within the city or maybe there's a requirement that your bioregion is bigger than that um, if you want to be expanding out to include your food and things like that. I can't remember the expression you used but there is this sense often of not being allowed to go backwards like we can't go backwards so of course we can't go backwards but we can certainly learn from beautiful things that we had in the past that we don't have anymore beautiful ways of being and that's where a lot of opportunities in this exploration come in to to reconnect to traditions and things like that that perhaps have already existed and it might involve some modification to make them work for us now but yeah some of the barriers i think have been this ongoing sense of or almost ongoing encouragement toward us kind of becoming more individual mm. yeah that we must just stand alone and we are just a single self and that's really deep in our in our psyches that's really deep in our culture even just knowing our neighbors for example like growing up in in devon you know we we probably knew most of the people who lived within you know a couple of miles of the house you know there weren't very many houses so it wasn't many people to know but but there's something beautiful about that and you know one of the one of the really simple invitations on this course and just for anyone who wants to explore the ecological self is um is to know your neighbours, you know. That, mm. that could be the first thing you do. If you don't know them, just knock on their door and introduce yourself. And, and you know, you might be received with exactly what we're speaking about, with this fear. Um, you might be received with a kind of sense of this, this person is strange. <laughs> but my encouragement would be to, to not, not be afraid of being judged in such a way because taking more steps in that direction is what community building is. Mm. I live in a kind of a community in a way um it's a it's a retreat center and you know each of us individually for sure is experiencing the the difficulties of building community because the the whole of the culture all of our work all of how we expect to consume our meals is is quite individual you know we we all want full control over what we're eating when we're eating what we're watching you know, what we're hearing and so as soon as you're kind of forced into that kind of community, there is there is a loss of, of control over your immediate experience and surrounding. And that's really stressful and I find that quite difficult. But also I recognise that when I'm going to go to the, the shared kitchen to make my dinner and I'm feeling introverted and I'm wanting quiet and space, I can't ask for it. You know, that's, that's one thing is a great lesson is recognizing what it is that I want and need and, and feeling able to ask for it and trusting that my community of people there can receive that well. And that's just about communication, which is another, you know, entire exploration. Mm -hmm. But equally, what about just giving into it and seeing that other person and saying, Hey, I'm feeling a bit this way. Do you want to share share a meal? Mm -hmm. And how that might look. And I certainly find 
even though it doesn't necessarily feel like what I want immediately. It can be massively nourishing and maybe even pull me out of that kind of ego-focused mind that it's mm. maybe swirling and spitting with ideas and dreams or whatever it might be that's, that's becoming overwhelming. You know, and, and how do we create more opportunities for that to pe- for people who don't live in community? You know, one step is to, to know your neighbours and feel that they're welcome to come and knock on your door and vice versa. But equally, you know, more, just more ways of meeting. So one of the blocks, you know, this, this I haven't thought about that much, but it, I have a sense that it's probably got some truth in it, is that the diminishing of the church, you know, the diminishing of mm. the church as a meeting point, as a, a regular touch point for people to go and gather and have some kind of shared belief in what they're doing there. I'm not religious at all, but I, I can't, in some way I miss it. <laughs> I never went to church. <laughs> But there's something that feels so beautiful about like, wow, on Sunday we go to this stunning building that's really well cared for and it's really old and simple and no one's on their phones and we're all just there to gather and sing songs and hear stories, you know. Mm -hmm. That sounds wonderful. And so, yeah, part of the the cultural exploration, and I think it's a necessity, you know, I think it's really important that we are exploring these things is, is this question of what, okay, maybe it's had unhealthy parts attached to it, but what are the great parts we can take out of it and how do we build them? And, Mm. you know, maybe they're bio-originally specific. Maybe they're not national or international ways of doing things, and so there's no prescription. And that's Mm. why I love this exploration, because it's actually, it might be different from even one village to the next or one street to the next in a busy city, you know. Place-based emergence, right? Like one place it might be a drumming circle and one place it might be a Quaker meeting, who knows? (laughs) Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and what feels right for those those people. And, and, you know, part of that can become this real interest in what it is for, for the people on the next street or the next village. And maybe a sharing, you know. Imagine that, mm. you know, an, an, an open festival once a year from the next village along where you can go and experience what it is that they do um, and just be interested by it and ask questions as to why, why is it so different there to it is here. Um, but for me, that exploration is individual and it's communal and it may also in some ways be national. Yeah, there are, there are questions of how certain things are held nationally and internationally. Mm. But all of these are just questions of of our culture and our society at the moment. Of things have changed really quickly. A lot has disappeared. A lot has appeared. And you know the role of of technology and social media. You know I'm sure it has beautiful roles to play, but it's also creating a lot of disconnect and environmental issues, personal issues. You know there's there's a lot wrapped up in it. It's not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know it's like what role do these things have that can be really positive and how do we use them as, as tools rather than be used kind of as tools ourselves? Um, mm. It's a difficult one. Yeah, I just did an interview with Helen and Albert Hodge and she spoke to that really clearly. She said, you know, people who are trying to create a new culture of ancient way of being, you know, of belonging and returning and remembering all the kind of themes we're talking about really are often being criticized while well, you're using the technology. So, you know, you can't, you can't preach that and then also be using it. She's like, no, let's be really clear. Like, of course, we're going to use the tools that are available to us in the moment, but we also want this to stop. Like we, we don't want our tax money to go towards building 5G towers and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Anyway, it was a good episode. Um, mm. Yeah, something I was really hearing that actually, as you were speaking before, you mentioned about the church. Um, I, I've got some friends who are religious and there's a few people in my family, you know, they go to church every Sunday. And I, I really, I see that. I, wow, they have such a staple of community. But the missing piece I find from the outside looking in is, again, it's so imbued in the Anthropocene. Hmm. So it's this kind of meeting the neighbours and the non-human neighbours and maybe merging those two worlds, you know, how can we, how can we gather in a way that does that? And what comes to mind immediately is foraging, for example, it's Mm. such a beautiful community activity. And obviously you run regular foraging sessions and you did run Ancestral, it was so beautiful. And at the same time, that has had its whole mainstreaming wave of food for free and this edgy notion of people 
going towards back towards nature through through a passion for foraging but then also not fully embodying reciprocity and so maybe you could just speak to your relationship with foraging I especially would love to hear about your bioregional life way mm. challenge that you set for yourself I feel really um excited to talk about foraging because it, ha- it has this kind of sense for me of it being my wizardry my sort of my tricksy magician coming through because I yeah I take people out every Saturday in normally in groups of people who don't know each other and we do a very simple foraging tour and there's a there's a slight kind of a, a backdrop of um, accidental building of relationships to nature that's framed in this like oh you know we can go out and we can pick food for free that's the people are interested in that there's a real draw to this opportunity to go out and and connect to the land but people often don't know the framing of it and so foraging is a great framing but it gives an opportunity to to add little snippets in so foraging itself is a beautiful activity but it's also you know it has a lot of potential to become just another part of a broken system you know if we if we over forage already diminished wild lands we're creating a lot of problems so how do we do it in a way that's sustainable and so it's a great opportunity to to speak to groups of people who maybe haven't thought about ideas like reciprocity in the context of food to drop those kind of conversations in and spark this between them and you know an opportunity to to put an invitation forth for people to take their shoes off so we stop by Mm. a a beautiful river called the Bachwen where we take water from the river to make wild tea and that time we normally have half an hour or 45 minutes there's an invitation for people to take their shoes off put their feet in the water jump in a pool if they feel to and just go off to the land and it's just beautiful because we're already a couple of hours into the walk people are moving extremely slowly Uh, they're paying a lot of attention to what's around them you know that's one of those kind of uh, magician's tools in foraging is like it's it has to be slow you know, you don't have to encourage people to be slow to search for foods that are hard to find you know, and to be paying attention. So people are moving incredibly slowly and they carry on that slow movement when they go off on their own. And it's just beautiful. You know, People go off and I see them just staring up at trees or dipping their hands and looking very closely at the water and smelling things. And it's it, it does. It creates a very beautiful connection. What was so so magical when you did the foraging at Ancestral was you allowed space for people to share all their different folkloric knowledge that came with that and songs were emerging and stories were emerging and even different language um, associations like Yarrow being Schafskarbe in German and this whole like good luck thing and all this oh it was so rich Mm. in what emerged around our kind of ancient relationship with the plants with the flora and fauna absolutely yeah yeah and there's there is a sense of like people often come on these courses thinking they don't know anything about foraging and it starts off with this kind of teacher student relationship actually maybe i don't know anything maybe you know everything already you know i can tell you the names and what's edible but you're then going to go on to do your own explorations of what it means to know that plant and so when someone asks you know what does it smell like what does it taste like or how, what would i do with it you know how would i cook with this it's like you tell me, you know, what does it smell like? What does it taste like? I can't, I can't tell you that. I can tell you how I interpret it, smell and taste. And people go off and I get these beautiful emails of people saying, you know, oh, I thought it tasted or smelled a bit like this. And so I cooked it up in this particular way and I created this dish. And it's just a beautiful opportunity to, to, to build that ecological self, to get people outside, moving slowly, connecting to the land. And, you know, the repercussions of that are enormous, potentially, you know, people... There, there is a lot of anxiety around foraging not being a sustainable activity. It's the mm. most sustainable activity, you know, if we're doing it wisely. You know, There's, there should be no fear of going out to harvest wild food with a healthy relationship to the land. Yeah, it's one of these. I have a lot of difficult conversations with people about uh, the kind of measurable versus the immeasurable, and it's this sense of like, I don't, I can't tell you the facts about how teaching people to forage will benefit the world environmentally or will affect carbon footprints but i i can promise you it will it will have a positive impact i'm absolutely sure of it people building a relationship with the land caring for it realizing they can eat from it it totally transforms their need to to tend to it to look after it and to be part of its its healing if you get into foraging or you start caring about swimming in your local rivers you know you do not want the food or the water to be polluted and so Mm. that's 
again, part of the journey that we're creating is going to be this question of what's mine to do here? You know, what's my calling? And it's unique to every single person on the planet. Everyone will mm. feel called to a different activity or a different way of participating in regeneration of, of a healthy living planet. And that's what's so exciting about it for me. It's, it is an, it's a non-prescriptive opportunity for people to get to know themselves in getting to know their landscape and their community and then feel this sense of purpose bubbling through as it's like, oh, I feel that I really care about this thing. Realizing that I really care about this one particular element. And there's so much to be done. You know, there's so much to be done. That's, mm. the, that's the sense of overwhelm that a lot of people are feeling, which I think gets in the way. Because if we look at the, the big picture, it's, uh, it feels absolutely unachievable, unobtainable to make any positive impact because there's so many barriers. You know? But yeah, arming people with this, um, this little purposeful project that they can discover feels as, as powerful as can be, really. I love Clarissa Pinkola Estes, and she's written, quote, ours is not the task of fixing the entire world at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. There we are. Beautiful. Yeah, how you've spoken about that then rippling out into bigger bioregions and into bigger, perhaps even global ideas. But, you know, we have to start with a deep listening that is right here. So tell me about your bioregion mm. life way. Yeah, so this was a, I like to set myself <laughs> sometimes foolish missions. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're always framed with, with the, uh, the hope of just learning. And so this one was, the intention was three months of only eating food grown or foraged within eight miles of my doorstep, basically. So it was a, it was a beautiful project I learned a lot from it and you know the first thing I did was put a, a lovely OS map up on the wall with a eight mile circumference drawn around my house and yeah, I just studied that zone you know that eight mile zone around where I live and firstly it was just like wow I live in a great place you know I live in a beautiful place and very exciting to explore all of these all of these footpaths that cover the land here you know, that's another really lovely thing that we have in the UK is this footpath system that I feel really grateful for. And actually, speaking of callings, you know, one of them that's come up for me is, you know, let's make sure we keep our footpaths. Mm. Let's make sure that they don't disappear. And so the yeah, that was the mission, um, and it involved hunting, rabbit, squirrel, fishing, sourcing food grown locally and ecologically. So immediately there was no access to, to any of the big shops because none of them buy any food from within such a small region. But I also was limited to one pound a day to buy food. This was self, self-imposed. It was, it was to, to get me out foraging, really, and to get me finding other ways of getting food. It was a beautiful experience. It was much more difficult than I expected, partly because actually where I live, there's not that much food being grown. There's a few farms that are doing absolutely beautiful work. And so they were the places that I was going to. But our most local cheese, I was very excited. It was going to take me five days to save up to buy a little round of it. But um, I discovered that the sheep were grazing, you know, well out of my bioregion, 25 miles south. And so, you know, according to my rules, it was no longer OK. It was no longer in my region. And there were a few things like that that came up. But, you know, I got into some bartering. And I'm actually working this afternoon for a, for a beautiful friend who gave me um, about five kilos of honey and a huge basket of, of vegetables from his land. He has a homestead and is a beekeeper and I'm helping him re-roof his shed this afternoon. And so things like that came through, just these opportunities. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have the time to be able to do that and fully recognize that that's not accessible to everyone. The bartering thing is, is complex. I ate really well, you know, I didn't eat enough calories. And so I stopped early. Um, I did a, a solid month of doing it properly. And then I brought back some other food with an increased budget and it's kind of taking me on to this next this next mission which in a way is the, the wider mission um you know i learned a lot about foraging and i can i can now tell people about what i learned on courses and in conversations and and i also learned everywhere that it's possible for me to buy great food in the local area and know how to support some of these farms tith and tech is a farm up the road and they've just sold uh, cooperative shares and so they're sort of spreading out to become community owned. And so part of mm. the part of the invitation again of the ecological self is, is exploring these opportunities. And so, yeah, this next mission 
it's not so personal, I suppose. It's more about how do I create a kind of framework of how people can eat well. So it's not necessarily about eating bio-originally. Um, it will involve a lot of that inevitably. But how can we feed the planet? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. starting, starting, I suppose, in the UK, because that's the context in which I'm sitting. So, yeah, these, these kind of simultaneous questions of how do we eat to nourish ourselves? How do we do that in a way that's affordable? How do we do that in a way that everyone on the planet can eat well? And how do we grow that food ecologically? And I harvested all my own sea salt as well. And that sea salt is amazing. It's delicious. Very easy, very beautiful process to, to gather. And yeah, we, we, we gathered it for the ancestral retreat as well. That by original diet took me away from the foods that I'm used to, which are, which are they're intense, you know, they're intense flavors. But our, our sensitivities increase. And it's, it's similar to the foraging walk when you're slowing down and you're connecting to the smells and things. You, you very quickly become more attuned to them and more open to them. Um, and when I'm sitting with a very, very simple plate of food, I'm paying a lot more attention to how it tastes. I'm really appreciating mm. it. And it's, it's distinctly different. Mm. The carrots grown ecologically compared to the industrially grown, which presumably have lots of pesticides and herbicides, they had 30 times as much vitamin K. Wow. And so when we're talking about an unhealthy nation, the NHS is struggling, it's crumbling. And one of the reasons is we're really unhealthy. We're mm. really unhealthy people. And part of that is that our food is unhealthy. I think of these small, but also really profound and really big steps and lifestyle changes absolutely can from the ground up change systems. I think we can often feel quite powerless and at the same time, paradoxically, the pressure on the consumer Mm -hmm. (laughs) in terms of the debates about um, carbon, for example, is so immense. But it makes me think of how the cultivation of belonging, you know, what that would do to the broader systems and to the infrastructure that's currently crumbling. Um, because if people if people truly belong, I think that will completely change consumerism. <laughs> it will change the relationship we all have with place and one another and ourselves. It would change how we move through the world, what projects arise. I mean, even just to think of the kind of projects that arise from that place of belonging, deep listening... And multiplying that by the amount of people doing this work and inquiring and then spreading that. And yeah, I just think this, it's really quite potent, this work. That's obviously why we're both doing what we're doing. We're trying to bring that deep remembering back through an embodied experience Mm. and not just to intellectualize it, but to actually start exploring a more animistic way of of interbeing it makes me think I know we've both done this actually previously um with with things we've been running but this idea of having conversations with trees with the Mm. river I'm curious if you can remember any of the conversations that came through for you yeah the first time I did that was um facilitated um by a kind of nature-based psychotherapist up in the Scottish Highlands and it's, it's a really interesting one for me because there is, at, at the absolute foundation, I am a pretty kind of normal Devon boy. You know, I don't, I don't have any sort of big spiritual beliefs or I struggle even with the word animacy and things like that. I'm not quite sure what it all means to me. But even in amongst that, I have these, these interactions with, with myself as well as other beings that do give this sense of like, there is something more available to us even if it's not in the way that I previously believed. We create a whole belief system around a single word and it blocks us into opening up to the opportunities that might be there that don't really involve any any belief, but they're just experiential. Yeah. And so, yeah, the one that comes to mind was asking a birch tree for advice. And it was as simple as approaching a birch tree with a, a notepad in my hand and quite in quite an embarrassed way you know I felt a little bit silly um but I was also really seeking help and I just said hey (laughs) do you mind if I ask you a question (laughs) and uh and I had this sense of like yeah no worries that's fine (laughs) which is something we do in the foraging as well you know we ask permission before we take and then I asked the birch tree for 
some advice on my life, some direction. And I found myself scribbling, scribbling and scribbling and hearing all of this wisdom. Uh, I didn't hear an external voice or anything, but it came through, you know, and maybe it came through me in relationship with this birch tree or just it just through me in the fact that I was standing in such a beautiful place uh, in front of such an amazing being. But something came through from wherever. I don't really care where it came through from. I'm interested, but I don't need to know. Um, because when I refer back to what I wrote in that journal, it's there's no doubt that it's wisdom. You know, it's it's exactly what I needed to hear. And quite often I need to hear it again. It feels like the kind of advice that we might receive from true elders. You know, if we that's that's a long term <laughs> goal, you know, having true elders um, flooding our mm. society. But they do certainly exist. And also they exist in the uh, the kind of more than human community. And that's available to everyone. You know, this is again always in the backdrop of my thoughts is how do we make this available to everyone make sure it's not inaccessible and there's so much of this stuff that's just like you can just go and do it you don't even need to learn anything or read anything you know there's so much opportunity to just just step outside um and mm. play with these practices without getting stuck in the kind of overwhelm of all that there is to do and all that's on offer right? which which is just another way of getting stuck firstly on the, on a screen probably but also potentially in your in your own head <laughs> that that was one of the really beautiful um kind of unions in the course you know we both had our own courses and now we've melded them and for me they were held very much as the masculine and the feminine and mine when i read your course material for the first time i realized that mine was it wasn't stuck in the mind but it was very intellectual it was quite mindy there was quite a lot of thinking. Um, and then there was kind of bolted on, there was this now embody the change, you know, now go out and do the thing that we've been talking about. And now your course was held more in this beautifully languaged feminine, um, full of mythology <laughs> and song and story. And now that's come in and the combination just feels super rich. And so the the time that does happen on screens, you know, is is perhaps it's that kind of rest time it's that like it's great if it's raining out or it's dark and you're feeling tired it's a great opportunity to do a bit of that research but the important thing being that you know that that's not what the course is you know that's that's a part of it and we can get really stuck just studying online stuff I've done plenty of it myself you know I've spent a lot of time reading about yoga and not all that much time doing it and so the, for the course to really work, people need to be dancing both parts fully. And it doesn't necessarily need to take much time, but if people do come through the course and they do each of the stages, their life will be really very, very different at the end of the, the 13 months to, to the beginning mm -hmm. in ways that, again, are immeasurable. You know, who knows what will unfold because it's all about relationship and making, making changes in your life that make sense in your particular context, in your particular place. Ah, oh, yeah. And, and then also to be doing this through a really lovely, slow spiral of the work that reconnects. Mm. Maybe you can just briefly share about Joanna Macy's approach to this. Yeah. So the work that reconnects. So it was designed by Joanna Macy as a tool for helping overwhelmed activists, mostly climate activists, but pretty much anything relating to social and environmental justice questions. Um, and recognising that that work, given that it's never ending and not often extremely emotional and difficult, there was a lot of overwhelm. And so she wrote this beautiful idea of this spiral that we can take ourselves through or we can go through with a group of people, ideally facilitated, which basically kind of shoots us out the other side. It takes us through the difficulty. The idea of the spiral is that it starts in gratitude. And so you, you begin by just going through a series of activities about what it is that you're grateful for in the world but then you move into the difficult part you know the the part of um your pain for the world you know what's what's going on what is what is your suffering and this is very personal you know, and this is in some ways what that eco ecological niche speaks to what calls you whether it's in your bioregion or in your work or in your life what calls you is it, is your niche you know it's it's personal for everyone and it'll be it'll be a fascinating thing to see what unfolds 
and then yeah you, the next phase is called seeing with new and ancient eyes and this is an opportunity to do a little bit like some of the stuff we spoke about listening to or speaking to um, voices of the more than human world and there's lots of different activities hidden in there and then the final part is going forth and this is like okay you've, you've done this work what's next what's yours to do and you can keep returning to this spiral over and over you know you can do it in 20 minutes you can spend a few days doing a workshop in it um, but it always kind of shoots you out the other side with this renewed vigor and this renewed recognition of what do you really care about and you know you can really feel that when you tap into these spaces when you speak to certain things and your voice quivers it's like you found something there's there's gold in that um, and mm. there's inquiry in that you know what's what is it that that calls you in that sentence or what is it that has such meaning for you in that sentence and that's how you can build this kind of going forth idea and so yeah she's been doing that work for a long time she's one of the true elders you know, that we've kind of mm. referred to um, and the the body of work continues to grow the deepen your roots and other courses we're we're writing are lightly held by this idea of, of of the spiral of coming from gratitude and going through these processes finishing with going forth which is really an empowerment exercise but the other piece of work that falls into the work that reconnects space is this um this active hope work which has been a massive framing for a lot of my work and my personal work as well. I think his name is Chris Johnston, who, who wrote a book called Active Hope with Joanna Macy. Um, and it's effectively just a, a beautiful, positive spin on the way we see the world, which can be really transformative. And effectively, it says, spend some time doing self-inquiry, external inquiry, what's going on in the world. What is it that you hope for? What is it that you would like to see happen in the world? And then you kind of flip, flip that hope on its head and you start searching for ways that that's already in existence. Because often there's this sense of the world is fucked at the minute and we're going to try and get to some point where it's no longer fucked. But actually, that's, that's not going to be a sudden flip. You know, we're, we're right in the middle of that in some messy space somewhere. Mm. You know, when I refer to places like Tidentec, to the, to the local farm here, it's like, that is my active hope in food systems mm. where I am. And so you can spend time exploring how all of the things you dream of happening in the future already exist. And suddenly you realize that your future does exist already right now. And you can inhabit it more and more by just supporting those systems. And it's a really, in, in some ways, it's a really challenging concept. I often write down these lists of, you know, what is it that I hope for in the world? What, is, what does the world look like that I'm envisioning? And, uh, you know, things like, oh, you know, we all just cycle everywhere. You know, we all, we all have access to, to bikes and cycle paths. And, and the invitation with Active Hope is like, okay, you can cycle everywhere if you want. That's fine. And then you're living in that future already. Mm. And, you know, you, of course, you never to be realized, sometimes there's other barriers in the way. But that's where the, the work comes in, you know, if that really is, if I'm called cool to that, what are the ways in which I can make it easier to, to for me and other people to cycle more? Mm. And, and some of them, you realize they're just accessible immediately. You know, oh, I wish that, you know, we could eat food from beautiful, cooperatively owned local organic farms. Like you probably can actually, that's one mm. of, that's <laughs> one of the ones that's really well progressed. And it's just about seeking it out and supporting it, finding, finding ways to engage with it immediately. So. So that part of the work that reconnects has been a massive framing for me of, of just living living in the world that I hope to see one day. You know, it's like yeah. it's beautiful to know that it's already here in so many ways. Totally, it makes so much sense to feed into the emergence of what you're calling in that's already yeah. there in order to to strengthen the calling in of of what you're deeply yearning for. Exactly. What's coming up yeah. for me when I heard you talk about that is the inner stories that need to be composted that prevent us from changing or from yeah really calling in the vi the dreams and visions where we are calling in because yeah. I, I i feel like that notion of active hope is a beautiful place to begin yeah with that composting of the stories that are that are blocking us from our belonging Absolutely, yeah. And they're, they're deep. They remain deeply embedded in me and in most people I know. Um, but that's not to say there's not really beautiful ways of, um, of taking some of their power away. 
And in doing that, we start to create these new narratives. Like, you know, we, we live by narrative and the narrative is a culturally created story. And we can, we can decide what narrative we inhabit. Narrative is just a story. So how can we step into to better stories or start telling better stories? And, you know, there's so many ways that are accessible for that. So busy We live in this crazy time where we're right in the midst of all of these merging stories and emerging stories, you know, different different possibilities of how we can how we can go. It's not something that's gonna be resolved quickly. It's gonna be complex. Yeah. The the opportunity there for me is in amongst all the complexity of what's going on in the world, the answers as an individual are so simple. Yeah. The, the opportunities and the ways to tap into to beauty and belonging and connection, they are accessible, they're simple, they're available right now. That overwhelm of the complexities is too much. Like We can't hold it. We, can't, yeah. we can have conversations about it. It's super interesting to talk about you know, these, these bigger picture things. But the real change is going to be grassroots, held by individuals, doing what some people might perceive as small work, but times by many billion, you know, times by a lot of people doing beautiful acts. And I find that very settling because the sense that everything I, I do has to be huge and has to impact, you know, everyone everywhere is, first of all, unlikely and improbable. Um, but it's also just overwhelming. And when I'm overwhelmed, I'm, I'm no good to anyone. You know? um, yeah. I have to have to remember that at the end of the day, the best thing for me to do is actually just make my dinner and enjoy it with my friends or my partner or whoever it might be and share a conversation that doesn't have to be hopeless and and that's profound you know for me that's really profound is these these simple acts and these simple ways of living because they take us away from thinking that these big complex messy systems are actually even particularly necessary when it's like mm. actually i get most of my food from around here i get most of my fun from my community and my connections to people here what what do I really need? You know? I think the exploration into voluntary simplicity and simple living is perhaps one of the biggest opportunities for, for positive change globally. Mm. The, the opportunity in the course that I'm most excited about is this idea of becoming kind of one of hopefully many, many, many ecological guardians, you know. And so we've got a big a big dream of of kind of filling out this map with people who have really spent the time and the energy to delve in and get to know and um, care for their ecosphere, their local bioregions and systems and communities. Um, and so it's it's a course that's really imbibed with a lot of hope. And so yeah, I feel I feel really proud of it. I feel really excited for meeting everyone who's going to join the course. This this cohort that we're kind of dreaming up. The Reindigenizing idea is complex in a, in a globalized world, but there's this opportunity as well to be like, well, I'm only going to be living here while I'm at university or while I'm doing this job for the next six months. But it's like, that doesn't matter. You can still feel like you belong there, you know, to, to mm. a certain depth in a really beautiful way that can be immensely profound, um, even if you're passing through, even if you're just going on holiday. There's, there's opportunities within this type of exploration for that to become so much more rich. Thank you for listening. Please do head to rootedhealing.org slash deepen to learn more about our course. 
And for podcast patrons, alongside this episode, we are releasing a post that includes a discount for the course. So if you're supporting us through Patreon and already receiving um, all this lovely exclusive content, make sure you keep your eyes peeled for this discount if you're interested in joining the course. Through deepened imagination, consciousness expansion and cross-cultural wisdom exchange, we explore human soul ecology to ignite collective healing, nature awe and interconnectivity. We offer nature immersive ceremonial gatherings, legal and safe psychedelic assisted psilocybin retreats, integrative healing courses and a growing collection of resources. Visit rootedhealing.org to learn more. Please do consider joining our Patreon community, where you can gift forward and support our work in exchange for bonus material, book and gift giveaways, meditations, workshops, episode transcripts, community discussion and discounts to our events. Your monthly contribution, which can be as little as £2 a month, helps us cover the costs of running the show and our hope is to gather enough gifting community to really go the extra mile with the show and its purpose. Come follow us on Instagram at Rooted Healing Co. or find us on the various platforms you tune into. And don't forget to rate and review the show if these stories and conversations are touching you. It's a beautiful act of reciprocity. Thank you. The music in this episode was gifted by Mike Howe, Chris Park, Kiara Gilmore and Natalie Nahai. If you'd like to gift your music to the Rooted Healing podcast, please reach out to us via the link in the show notes. I'm your host, Veronica Stanwell. Thanks for listening.